Why did you decide to become a Muslim? Um, is that is that volume okay? You can hear me. Um, I think it was it was when I was about 17. I started to question why I believed what I did. Um, I started to wonder: Do I believe what I do because I think it's true, or is it simply because this is what I've been raised to believe? Um, I was raised in a very open-minded Christian household. My mum was pretty radical. Um, and I always had a very um, positive connection to God, but I found when I was about 17, as I guess a lot of people do when they're in their teens and start becoming quite existential, um, I, started to, I, had, I started to have a lot of questions that I didn't feel I was getting um, answers for. And so I decided to start looking into different religions. Um, except for Islam, because I thought that looked like a, a sexist, outdated, barbaric religion that no <laughs> sensible person, especially a woman, would want anything to do with. Um, but despite myself, I kept coming across information about Islam. I kept, um, you know, I'd turn on the TV and I'd find a story about Muslims on TV or I'd be flicking through the newspaper and come across an article. So I kept sort of being presented information about Islam without looking for it. And I found that when I started to look um, into what the religion said about itself as opposed to what I saw Muslims doing in the name of Islam and what I saw McDonald's journalism saying about Islam, um, I, I, to my surprise, found that it made a lot of sense to me. And um, so I started to look into it a lot more seriously. It wasn't until I was 19, though, that I actually became Muslim because I was, um, I was really worried about how my family was going to react, especially my mum, um, who had seen Not Without My Daughter. So. Um, it didn't have the most favourable <laughs> view of Islam. Um, but I think it got to the stage for me when I was about 19 that I realised, um, look, this actually really makes a lot of sense to me and I can't um, live my life just to make other people happy in me and I have to make this choice for myself. And so it was at about that point that I decided to become Muslim. And was there something that you felt was missing in your life previously that... I'm not sure if it was any sense of lacking or a sense of... To me, it didn't feel like a rejection, per se, of Christianity or my former life or anything like that. It felt just more like a continuation and a crystallisation of things that made sense to me and um, a concept of God that made sense to me. Um, it really engaged me intellectually before it did spiritually, I think. Um, a lot of it... Yeah, I like the fact that it in engaged me as a, an intellectual being as well as a spiritual being. Um, so I think that it was really just a lot of small pieces that just sort of came into place at the, at the right time. Did you know your husband at that time? I did know Waleed. Um, I met him when I was 16, but I, as Waleed loves to tell everyone, I... Um, I, when I, I didn't become Muslim for him, and in fact, when I did become Muslim, a lot of people in the Muslim community started saying to me, you know, you and Walid would be really good together. And I actually said, um, no, no, I'm not interested. And one day, one night, Walid rang me and sort of expressed an interest, and I said, <laughs> listen, I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on earth. So <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I've, tr I've never lived that down. <laughs> um, so it certainly, it certainly wasn't for Waleed, but then it was, I think, a couple of years later I actually realised, you no, know, actually, everyone was right, he's a really good guy, and oh my goodness, what have I done? I've really put my foot in it there. Um, but fortunately for me, Waleed was a very big man, and when I went back to him and said, look, yeah, I think I made a mistake, I actually really like you, and... Yeah, it's sort of, he was very kind about it and, yeah, big about it, like I said. Although in pretty much every interview we do together, he makes sure this story comes up. So <laughs> seven years into marriage and I've never lived it down. It's sounding a bit as if um, whatever you say, there's no way on earth you'll do, you'll do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there are many forms of Islam across the world. I'm mm. um, just wondering... Um, by what principles do you live your life? Hmm. Well, definitely I consider that um, I live my life according to, I guess, a, a mainstream or orthodox Islamic um, paradigm, and that's how I raise, you know, that's how we raise our children. Um, certainly I think I have a, a westernised approach, approach to Islam because I'm a western individual and I have a western mindset. I have a western education and I've brought that to my... Um, to my approach to Islam, which is, you know, a very questioning mind, um, a rational mind, one that um, a natural distrust of authority for authority's sake, that sort of thing. Um, but also that I would, and but I don't, first of all, I need to say I don't think those things are antithetical to Islam at all. Uh, but also, I do consider myself to be to have a, like I said, a mainstream orthodox practice to Islam. You know, we pray five times a day. We fast Ramadan, we eat halal food, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's, I guess it's an interesting existence because Islam, despite its long history in Australia, still is in many ways very new to the country and it's sort of in a community form. Um, and so I think an organic Australian Islam is growing at the moment um, and it's being established and created at the moment. So it's very interesting to see what's happening with our community and the approach that we bring to our faith. And it's, it's nice to be a part of that. Mm. How would you um, distinguish that organic Australian Islam from, from other forms? Um, I think it's... Well, I guess the, yeah, the organic Australian Islam that I'd see is one that is you know, primarily made up of converts and second and third and fourth generation Muslims, people who haven't had their majority experience of Islam overseas. I think we have quite a laid-back approach um, to the faith. Um, I think, like I said, I think we come with the Western critique attitude towards things, which I think is very healthy, and I think it's something the Muslim world really needs at the moment. Um, I think, uh, and, and you can see it play out in just very little ways, the way um, we have sort of Australianised certain religious practices. For example, for the Eid prayer, we have two religious holidays. You both are called Eid. It's very common for me and my friends to get together for a barbecue, for Eid, that sort of thing. Um, it's just these little ways that we've, we've made it Australian. And I guess, you know, like things like Salam Cafe and the other practices I see going on in the community, it's this... Um, it can be tricky at times because I think Australians by nature are quite irreverent um, and we like that about ourselves, whereas Islam places quite a strong emphasis on reverence of the sacred. And so for an Australian Muslim, we need to walk that line um, carefully, um, which is why a lot of people weren't sure if Salam Cafe, for example, would work because it seemed that we were um, mocking the sacred, which we obviously didn't think we were, but maybe I know we'll come to that later. Mm. But I think... Um, yeah, I think it is that just sort of uh, Australianised approach of being laid back and um, looking at things critically and trying to get rid of a lot of the BS, I think, that's come from overseas, a lot of the cultural baggage that we've seen come from overseas that has somehow been infused with our religion. I think when you're approaching it as a relatively new community, you can have a much clearer eye about stuff that has that has seemed to have seeped into the religion that doesn't really have any place in it, simply because Islam has existed in cultures overseas for hundreds of years and the two have unfortunately become meshed. So it's easy for us to sift the, the two out. Are there activities and behaviours and perhaps attitudes um, that you formerly had that you, or did that you don't now? Um, 
Well, I never really drank, so that wasn't a big deal to give up. Um, I'm not sure, really. I mean, I was 19. I was still, I was still relatively young when I became Muslim. Um, I don't think there really is a huge amount. Um, I, yeah, like I said, I never really drank anyway, so that wasn't a big deal to give up. Um, and I still do all the sort of things that I always did. You know, I still study, I still work, I still go out with my friends and, you know, that normal sort of stuff. Mm. So I'm not sure if there has been... I think a lot has been added to my life, but I don't really feel like a lot has been taken away. Mm. Um, has your faith affected um, your tastes in things like art, music? Mm. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting, actually. I think... Um, I definitely seem much more inclined towards, you know, Middle Eastern and Moroccan and, and that sort of thing, aesthetics in that sense. Um, I guess that's, and I guess that's my way of trying to find my way within a very old tradition and, and finding my place in that. Um, and I think that's through doing a lot of travel in the Muslim world as well and feeling a connection to that. Um, in terms of music, unfortunately, I still have pretty bad taste in music. <laughs> I still listen to terrible FM radio and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, I think what surprised me is that my taste in food has really widened. I think, um, you know, 10 odd years ago, the Australian palate was still a bit bland. You know, it was just standard for at home for us to have chops and three veg for dinner. And so I find that, um, you know, I'm much more um, courageous and interested in foods. You know, I really, I never used to like things like olives and dates and, and all that sort of stuff. But now um, I, I genuinely feel a, a natural affinity towards it, I guess, not just because of for cultural reasons, but those foods actually have a real place in our religious tradition as well. So I'm no. You know, I have an attachment in that sense too. <laughs> um, I know that you've seen e-cats in uh, Malaysia, I think. Mm. Um, what impression do, do they have on you? Um, I think the first thing that struck me is just, it's a really good example of the diversity of the Muslim world. The Muslim world is just so extremely diverse and I think clothing is a really good um, example of that, you know, the cats that you see. It, I mean, the fir one of the first things that really surprised me was that a lot of them are silk and you see men wearing them where um, in Orthodox Islamic law men should never wear silk. It's actually forbidden. Silk and gold are meant only for women. So it's very interesting to see that this was the standard cultural dress of a lot of these very practicing Muslim countries. Um, and just, just so you see that, but you'd never see men, for example, in Saudi wearing that. You'd never see men in Northern Africa dressed like that. And it was nice when I think we're at a time in the Muslim community where a lot of people are trying to homogenise us and make us all the one thing to see. Actually, for 1,400 years, we've had a very div diverse tradition in every respect, from the food we ate to the way we approached our faith. And I, I hope that we don't ignore that. Mm. There is actually um, quite a lot of controversy in various parts of the world about the way in which um, Muslim people, and particularly nowadays women, Dress, um, which I'd like to discuss, but just to, what are the um, main guidelines in terms of Islamic dress? Um, it, there actually aren't a lot of specified guidelines. The idea is that for men and women, the clothes shouldn't be tight, um, and um, they should be modest, so um, you know, relatively covering, and. Um, they should, for women, the general idea is that they should cover everything except the face, hands and, and feet. Whereas for men, um, the minimum men should cover is between the navel and the knee, but in the vast majority of um, Muslim countries, men cover a lot more than that. You know, if you go anywhere in the Gulf, the men cover pretty much as much as the women do. They would never go out with short sleeves on, with you know, bare legs, they would never go out with their head uncovered. It seems really um, ill-mannered. But in terms of strict, if you're looking strictly at what the religious law specifies, that would, that would be the case. And so that's why you'll find, because there's, it's relatively, there, there aren't a lot of prescriptions, um, that's why you'll see, you know, the way, for example, Muslim women dress in Malaysia is very different to the way mm -hmm. women dress in Tunisia, to Somalia, you know, those sort of countries. Each culture has sort of found its own way in that regard. Mm. And um, I heard you once on Salam Cafe saying, oh, we should be over asking about the hijab and why I'm wearing the hijab and so on. And I actually applauded you on that particular night, thinking, yes, 
good on you. But reflecting on that, <laughs> <laughs> reflect, <laughs> reflecting on that, um, throughout history there's been all sorts of discrimination and retribution in terms of the way people dress, not just um, Muslim dress in, in various ways. Um, and it's pretty obvious today that in some Western countries and even in some Muslim countries um, that we're far from a consensus on the issue. So let's start by asking why you wear the hijab. <laughs> um, so why do I wear hijab? Yes. I think um, I wear the hijab ultimately as an act of worship to God. That's ultimately what it comes down to. As a Muslim, I think... Um, Muslims believe that you have the potential to um, make anything you, you have the potential to make anything you do become an act of worship. Um, as a Muslim, if anything is done with the right frame of mind, you can turn the mundane into the sacred. And so um, the way that we dress is simply a part of that. You know, the way that we eat, um, you know, the way we put our shoes on, everything. Some people have said, you know, this um, fixation on the minutiae is a signal of a very um, juvenile religion. But for us, we just see it as the opportunity for everything you do in your life to be the potential for a connection to the Creator. And so for me, I dress the way that I do as, as an act of worship. I think it's something that... Um, well, I think there are different, legitimate differences of opinion amongst Muslim scholarship about how women should dress. Um, the position that I follow, at least at the moment, is that I f feel comfortable dressing the way that I do and I feel this is part of my tradition. Um, so ultimately, that's what it comes down to for me. But I think it's also important to know that for pretty much as many Muslim women as there are in the world, there will be that many different reasons for why they cover. Um, the majority of them would say that they do it out of it, as again, for themselves as an act of worship to God. But for a lot of women, there's also other um, reasons laid on top of that. Um, I, don't, I think it's for a lot of women, it is multifaceted. For some, it's simply part of their culture. That's just, what they, that's just how they dress in their culture, and it's part of their cultural identity. For some, it's a political um, statement. You know, in countries like Iran and Egypt, women actively put the hijab on as a way to protest against the government that they saw as taking away their rights and as against colonisation. And for some women in some cultures, the more you cover, the higher your status. Um, so they do it for those reasons. In some Muslim countries, the women are simply forced. You know, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, they have to dress this way. They don't have a choice. But, of course, the flip side for that being in some um, Muslim and non-Muslim countries, women are forced not to dress this way. It's not just countries like France where mm -hmm. covering your hair in certain, um, in certain institutions is prohibited. Turkey and Tunisia don't allow women to mm -hmm. cover either. Um, and they're, I mean, they're Muslim, mm -hmm. so-called Muslim countries. So I think, um, I guess I find that, very disappointing as, as a Muslim but also as a woman that I would really like us to see the day where a woman can choose to dress the way that she wants to and it's nobody else's business and she's not sanctioned for that and she's not taken as how she does or doesn't dress or how much she does or doesn't cover as being some sort of indication as her worth as a human being and I think for too long men either as individuals as religious leaders as the state have tried to control women by how much they dress whether it be too much or too little and I'd really like us to move past that um, I don't think that's going to happen for a while but um, the ideal I think that would be. Mm. I, I suppose that um, you know there are views that um, the hijab symbolises uh, women as an inferior sex that it oppresses women and as you've just said happens in some countries um, and men you did mention before in some countries men do cover but it seems that the dress code isn't quite as restrictive for men and I'm just wondering, you know, why the, why, um, the laws, the mm. LORE laws, should be uh, stronger for women. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And like I said, I think there's been some interesting scholarly debate on that. A, a, a number of, especially modern-day Muslim scholars, have said that really what the laws are trying to say is that um, men and women should simply be dressing modestly according to the, cu the customs of the area in which they live. So if you live in a country like Australia, it's not necessary for you to cover your hair because um, you can dress 
quite modestly by your society standards without covering your hair. Whereas in another country like Saudi Arabia, it would be very immodest for you to walk around in a t-shirt, so you should accommodate to that. Um, a few modern-day Muslim scholars have taken that approach, and I think there is definitely um, valid reasoning in that. And they also make the valid point that um, you know, you can certainly, you can argue that there's nothing in the Quran that says a woman have to co has to cover her hair. Um, but a lot of scholars disagree with that and that interpretation. I think um, definitely the amount that the majority of scholars agree has to be covered is more for a woman than as a man in the public sphere. Um, and I guess the way that I, and the way I guess that I can one way I guess I have of looking at it is that even in Australia we do have different standards for the way men and women dress. It's no big deal, for example, if you go out on a Saturday morning and see a man mowing his lawn in nothing but his shorts, you know, not wearing a shirt. No one would really bat an eyelid. If a woman was doing that, people would sort of be taken aback. That mm. Even in Australia we do have different standards on how much um, men and women should have to cover. Now obviously that's not the same as um, you know, what you'd find in Afghanistan, for example, but I think every culture has a different approach to what is um, appropriate, how much men and women cover. Um, so I think for me, you know, I've been wearing the hijab, uh, yeah, 11 years now I've been Muslim. And I guess it's just something that I feel really comfortable with. It doesn't, I don't really see it as a, a big deal. There definitely are not in the main religious obligations, the rules are the same, the laws are the same, men and women have to pray and fast and all those sort of things. The obligations are literally the same. But in the, in the smaller areas, um, there are differences, for example, that women are, the majority opinion is that women should cover more. There is also the opinion, like I said, that men are not allowed to wear gold and silk, whereas women are. So there is that distinction. And I think because traditional Islamic scholarship has played an, placed an emphasis on, um, uh, a clear distinction in the dress between men and women and that's where that's come from. Is there an onus on women that relates to the dress in terms of being, um, you know, the controllers of behaviour, mm. for example? Because I think for a lot of non-Muslim uh, women in Australia, um, we do see some fairly disconcerting behaviour. Mm. Um, I, I, I'm thinking in terms of... Um, well, at the extreme of some dreadful rape, gang rape cases we've had here where you've had a sheikh um, mm. saying that the way the Western women were dressing was putting themselves yeah. out like meat. Yeah. You had in the court the mothers of uh, some of the perpetrators of the violence um, swearing basically at female lawyers dressed in their suits and calling mm. them whores because... Mm they weren't conforming. And I'm just wondering how you feel you deal with, you know, mm. what would you like to see happen yeah. in terms of that problem? Um, I don't think that's something that's just alarming to non-Muslims. As a Muslim woman, I find it. Mm. In fact, it might even offend me more because I think these people think they're doing, what they're doing is religiously sanctioned. And then I know then I have to go out in the street and people look at me and think that I agree with that. Mm. Um, you know, that behaviour is so unequivocally un-Islamic. Um, it, it would be very difficult for them to find evidence to support that sort of approach and it, I don't care if it's an imam that says it. I mean it's, mm. it's very clear. I think the sad thing is and it's, um, there has been an unfortunate thread within our tradition where I think um, men have tried to use have tried to blame women for the impious failures of men and they like to, um, you know, it's an unfortunate argument that we hear outside of the Muslim world as well, well she was asking for it, well if she didn't dress like that then you know what, I mean it's not my fault, what can I expect, you know, what do you expect? Um, again and again in the Quran God says that no one can be blamed for the sin of another person. So even if we do have these, even if we accept, okay, there's these religious rules that women should dress a certain way and men should dress a certain way, even if a woman walks down the street naked, Islamically, no man has the right to even look at her, let alone in any way violate her or touch her. Um, it's, 
you know, it's interesting, the verses, and there's actually only two verses in the Quran that talk about the way a woman should dress, and many, many more talking about far more important things like honesty, justice, integrity, and those sort of things. But it's interesting that in one of the two verses which does talk about the way a woman should dress, the verse actually proceeds by saying, men, you dress modestly and lower your gaze. And women, you dress modestly and you lower your gaze. The idea being that this concept that there is an onus on women to um, dress in a certain way because men can't control themselves is simply erroneous. It's, and it, you can see it in reality. Women, old women are raped in nursing homes. Women who cover fully in the burqa in Afghanistan get raped. You cannot say that, well, if they hadn't dressed so provocatively, if they hadn't led me on, then none of this would have happened. Um, it's unfortunate and it's sickening that men in my religious community say that. Um, I cannot condemn it strongly enough as a Muslim, as a woman, as a feminist. Um, it's just, it's a sickness that needs to be weeded out. Like I said, this is something that's unique to the Muslim community. Unfortunately, that opinion exists outside of the Muslim community as well. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, in light of the gang rape things and the rightfully helpful comments made by Sheikh Halali. Um, the Muslim community has to be honest with itself about dealing with these, these issues um, because, it, I mean, it's a sickness. It's, it's ultimate, that's ultimately what it is. It's a sickness and it's, it's un-Islamic. So there's really, there's no way around that. And I guess the feminist side of it, in fact, is one of the things that a lot of women worry about. I think we tend to think we fought so hard for equality and uh, as you say, this sort of thing is not helpful to anyone. But what, what is the, um, you know, how would you characterise the relationship between men and women, perhaps your own relationship? Mm. Um, you know, I can only talk, yeah, I can only speak from my own experience, but all the relationships that I have with Muslim men in my life have been I'm very positive and supportive and egalitarian. I'm here because my husband is at home with our two children. Um, I recently went to Spain for a conference for nine days and my husband stayed home with our two kids and I got home and he'd done the housework and made dinner and done the washing and done the grocery shopping. Um, you know, and I think this isn't unique, it isn't because my husband is, you know, strange or going against the teachings of Islam. We believe that that is what our religion teaches. That, um, Men and women, you know, the, you'll find nowhere in the Quran does it say that women are meant to be in a relationship of obedience to husbands. In fact, it says that you, men and women are partners to each other and you are meant to be garments of one, one of the other, um, protecting each other. And so, you know, I look at my friends who are Muslim and they have similar relationships with their husbands who are supportive and encouraging and it's egalitarian and it's equal and... That's just how it works. Now, that's obviously not to say that's how it is in the entire Muslim world, but that's also not how it is for the rest of the non-Muslim world either. Culture plays a role and individuals play a role and, and that sort of thing. But I don't think that our relationship is um, anything unique, and I certainly don't think it's that way in spite of Islam. I think it's that way because of our religious tradition. Mm. To what extent have you been abused for wearing the hijab and have mm. you ever sort of thought about whether maybe it might be more... Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've certainly had my fair share of, uh, <laughs> you know, abuse on the street and um, uh, shop assistants that clearly don't want me in their shop and people that seem alarmed when I get on their aeroplane and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I definitely, you know, I'd be lying if I said I haven't thought, look, I should just take this off. It's, it's causing too many problems. This is too hard. If it's meant to be about modesty, then I feel like I'm attracting more attention, if anything, by wearing it. Um, but I think, you know, especially after things like September 11 and the London bombings and that sort of thing, you know, where I'd, people would yell at me on the street or yell things at me in the car. And I think especially once I had children... You know, I, my daughter's six now and we go out on the street and she hears what people say and she sees the way they look at me and, and they start to pick that negativity up and I don't know how to explain, you know, I don't want to ex have to explain racism to my children and discrimination and bigotry and that sort of thing. So I wonder, well, do I take it off? But then I guess for me, 
it was also the message that, well, what does that say to my children as well? That if enough people beat you down and tell you you're wrong, then you'd be ashamed of who you are and that you have to change who you are because some racist idiot on the street doesn't like it. What, what does that tell you about your religion as well and integrity and those sort of things? Um, so I think I've, I came to the place within myself where I made the choice that um, I will want, I want to keep dressing this way but I'll also take the opportunity instead of pe just giving in to, um, to discrimination and bigotry and all that sort of stuff to say I'll, I'll be who I am and I'll sh try to live a life to show people that being Muslim is nothing to be ashamed of and me dressing this way isn't meant to be a political statement to make you feel uncomfortable and me dressing this way isn't me saying um, well I think you should dress like me or this, me dressing this way isn't an, is not a negation of everything feminism has fought for for the last however many years. Um, this is just simply who I am and it's part of my faith and I feel no contradiction between wearing a hijab and being Australian or wearing a hijab and being a feminist um, or wearing a hijab and being liberated or anything like that. And if anything needs to change, maybe it's your negative attitudes and not who I am. Um, because if everyone had to change because there were ignorant idiots out there, we would live in a very sad society, I think. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that we don't seem to have any problem with uh, Christian nuns wearing <laughs> habits and, and so on, but um, if it's the leaders of religion, but we do when it's a group. And then I think not only here, but in other countries, it's been compared with uh, people wearing swastikas and so on. Mm. Um, but Despite um, you know, accepting what you're saying there, nonetheless, in some other countries, the hijab has been banned in schools, in government buildings. That's not just in France and mm. some of the European countries. Um, there's the view that, that it um, isn't good for a secular society. Mm. Does, does that concern you at all? I mean, does, does that disconcert you at yeah, all? Yeah, well, I think anything... It bothers me on a few levels. It bothers me anywhere that sort of limits the choice of women in, in all spheres but limits the choice of women in how they choose to dress worries me or I feel uncomfortable about. Um, I think also it worries me because I, while I can see what certain governments are doing in that they think to do this it will help minimise radicalisation and that sort of thing, I think it's so counterintuitive because all that's going to happen is the women that dress like that who really feel it's my obligation, I have to dress like this and if I don't then I can't leave the house, you are simply going to isolate these women more. Um, and soon all they will feel is, well, the only place I can go to school is this religious madrasa down the road because it's the only one where I can dress the way that I want. That, if you want a ticket to isolation and um, radicalisation, I think this is a good start. You know, I really think you, ideally, you want a society where um, these women and these people feel part of the society, feel welcome and part of the society, are encouraged to participate in and be educated by the society. I think that's a ticket to a, a healthy, um, non-radicalised society. And just from travelling, not only in the Muslim world, but in, um, throughout Europe and, and, and that sort of thing, I realise just, um, you know, and I certainly don't want to get on a <laughs> patriotic bandwagon, but I realised just how grateful I felt for living in Australia, in a, in a country which is not, um, you know, it's obviously not a Muslim country, but that there are laws in this country that protect the right of people like me to not only practice my religion but that it's against the law for someone not to employ me because of how I dress or for how a Sikh man dresses in his turban and that sort of thing. Um, I, you know, I was just so incredibly grateful for that after seeing what's going on in a lot of European countries and also a lot of Muslim countries, you know, where, where minorities are also discriminated against and Muslims who don't fit the dominant political line are discriminated against. Um, you know, I really am really grateful for the way it works here, I think. Susan, there's a great many other things I'd love to ask you, but I'm afraid we've run over <laughs> time. So thank you very, very much. Thank you.